Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Before we get started, we'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, I'm going to take over this week for what's going on. Although I do not have any fantastic stories about cats bringing in gophers or John's opinion on cargo shorts. <laughs> We have something special coming up for everyone who's listening to the show. In the next week, few weeks, you're going to see pop up in your feed some special episodes because the three of us are going to be cohabitating for some special recordings of the show where we're going to find some more ways to get some more detail on so far what we've seen in season one. Because believe it or not, guys, we're coming up on for just four or five episodes, maybe six episodes away from the end of the season. We're going to see how many people we can fit in Dominic's closet. <laughs> hey. Hey, if I'm doing recordings inside of this closet, it's called a studio. Closet when there's clothes in here. When I'm recording, it's my studio. <laughs> gotcha. So, but don't what... bother me when I'm recording, guys. <laughs> Gosh. Odd. What we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be getting together and being able to do, um, be able to do this nightmare podcast while we're all together and the more hijinks, probably a, a lot more laughter. Cue the vacation music. <laughs> it's like the perfect segue into a vacation montage. A, right. A, typical like or maybe not vacation montage because this is a Miami Vice podcast it should be a montage of all three of us riding furiously inside of a boat across the ocean yeah I don't know about you guys but <laughs> I'm buying those little bikini bottoms like Castillo has in this episode for Dan <laughs> 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 this week we are talking about season one episode 15 because again the pilot is two episodes for us titled Golden Triangle Part 2 which is we are I think going into this we were all super excited for where for what this second part of the episode was going to be i don't know how it how we're all going to feel by the end how well they were able to deliver on this the second half of this story i think if you look back at golden triangle part one i think we had a little bit of everything in that episode so i mean it, it was definitely going to be hard to top yeah well this this episode originally premiered on january 18th 1985 it's directed by david ansbaugh who actually directed two more episodes in the run including one of our upcoming episodes called rites of passage it's written by Ma Maurice Hurley and Michael Mann. Of course, Michael Mann, the showrunner. But Maurice Hurley, I want to make a correction from last week. I said last week that two-part episode where it does have the same writer, and I'm wrong. Maurice Hurley actually did write for the for last week's episode. But he was the teleplay writer. So he didn't come up with the story. He wrote the screenplay for the story. And in this episode, he actually wrote the whole story for this episode. We may also, why I had another reason to have high hopes for this episode, is that he was also the writer of Noah exit with our our favorite maybe favorite star in buck buck bruce willis <laughs> i love buck buck <laughs> <laughs> you can't say it yet we haven't made that episode <laughs> Gosh. let's move on and give our rundown of this week's episode all right, let's get started because I think that this is, we have a lot to talk about, although this is a very slow episode. We begin with our a long opening sequence. Is it just me or was this one exceptionally long before we finally got to the credits? Nah, I don't think I so. I think it was, it was just having to see Edward James Elmos in a Speedo <laughs> that made it just seem like it took forever. I don't think he was, I don't think he has ever had a body where it was like that, like fit wearing a Speedo. I don't think he's that type of person. So it was very awkward. I don't know how to feel with this opening because yes, we start off with a montage, right? Castillo standing on the beach. You see him get down to just a Speedo looking out into the water. He's like going for like an exercise swim, right? He's not just actually going out there because that's he likes to swim in the ocean. It's more like this is p part of his routine. He's going to work out, but it's, it's. I'm never going to look at Castillo the same ever again. You're just going to imagine him slowly popping up out of the water with his wet mustache as he runs his <laughs> hands through his hair? <laughs> like, if you're not uncomfortable See, by the end of that, the, like, the, you're doing something wrong. The whole time he's swimming, I'm picturing him swimming with, like, a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> Well, when he's swimming, he's swimming hard. Like, he's working hard while he's swimming. And he's having, like, by the end of it, we have this, it's like back and forth, like, different angles of him swimming with the song playing. And he's swimming his ass off. And the swimming goes on for a long time. And by the end of it, you see, like, his wife in the water, too. So he's just, and then it goes back to him and he stands up and he stops swimming. And it's not, he's just imagining her, you know, and kind of like back to his roots on how he would have met her because he was living in Thailand. So maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's turning 
trying to suggest water was involved somehow with their relationship, maybe? I don't know. Are relationships <laughs> elemental? Like, <laughs> 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 she was my water. Now you're my wind. <laughs> <laughs> and I... I mean, at, at, by the end of this swimming scene, I've already seen way too much of Castillo's body. I, I feel like we we have connected on a different level now. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's, it, let's do everyone a favor. Let's just <laughs> so Tub Croc and Tubbs they they get there right. They also interrupt Cre- Castillo. Croc and Tubbs. He knows he doesn't want anyone to see him. Even after they talk, he says, "Don't." Don't come unannounced ever again. Like, but he knows that he doesn't want to show off no. that body. See, I don't think that's why he says call next time. He says call next time because I think sometimes he swims in a nude. I think we got lucky. <laughs> No. Well, that's what that's what's weird I don't about know. this. That's what's weird about this opening scene is that he's out swimming in the ocean, but it's not. It's clearly not at his house. He has water going by his house, but it's clearly not there. You think that that's going to be the end of the opening sequence? We're going to go to the credits, but it's not. We go to Castillo's house, and he's just foot up on this like water going by the back of his house. It kind of they made it look like he's there in a different country, but it really is just his house. There's like, and I guess it's because See, you know, I think the story they're... of Ca- Castillo is that he was in thailand see i think they're trying to imply that he lives on the beach without having to actually rent a house on the beach yeah that's true <laughs> I, I, the ever budget conscious I, I think the it's actually just a canal back there <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> they're just trying to convey like he lives on the beach he lives in this really nice house and then they take us to this house in, uh, off a canal in fort lauderdale <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's what, so that's, we think that the the opening credits are going to start, but it doesn't. We go to, to Castillo's house, Crockett and Tubbs show up and they tell him like, hey, we're going to help you look for your wife and run down Lao Li. With some convincing, Castillo eventually says like, sure, I know how we can, I know who will know where Lao Li is and you're we need to go talk to Menton. And then Castillo also tells just... him like, hey, call next time before you don't just show up at my house, which is pretty gutsy by the vice team, right? To show up at your boss's house while he's just retrospectively staring out into the bayou out the back of his house well they want in on this action and uh tubbs even goes so far as to speak to castillo in oh just horrible spanish (laughs) (laughs) he like like which i don't even get because clearly castillo (laughs) speaks thai right spanish (laughs) um but i do want that something that's important for my view on this episode is that steel basically says that he cannot use the miami vice as his own personal police force he makes that statement and then the rest of the episode happens. And the rest of the episode is Castillo using the Vice Police Department as his own personal investigation team to tie up old ties from when he was a DEA agent. Hey now. Thank he you. tries Thank you. many times to tell them to go back onto their other assignments, okay? It's because At the one Miami, point the time the he Miami takes PD, them out to dinner. The Miami PD are just they're there for each other, okay? They're a family. Well, you think at the end of this scene where Castillo tells him, okay, you can't just show up in my house. You think we go to the opening credits, but we still don't go to the opening credits. We go back to the precinct. The duo and Castillo are just watching Trudy use the computer, which I'm pretty sure at this point Trudy is the only person who knows how to use the computer. <laughs> right. <laughs> they are all totally dependent upon her being able to look up stuff in the computer. They're looking for Menton. They're trying to find out where he is. There's like a business that's got a P.O. box. They can't figure it out. And Trudy finds the address for Minton and they're like how'd you find it she's like in the fucking phone book what do you mean <laughs> how did I find so it? Well, I, I just want to point Menton. something He's out right there I, I yeah I just want to point something out that this scene has not changed in 30 years of television hey Trudy google Dale Minton for us <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, that it's, is right. all that is happening here all modern police shows too have the same person right they're like the tech people and that's basically all that they do is they just Google people's names until they find more information. And then, then they just have to yes. listen to everyone else around them just scream and hit and hit <laughs> at them <laughs> while looking at pictures. Uh-huh. Yeah. Then, so, so then you would think at the end of that scene that we're ready to start the opening credits. But you'd be wrong. We still have one more place to go. Now we're going to go to this is Menton. And he's at a massage parlor slash prostitution house. Getting in that Miami. morning massage. <laughs> yeah. Tubbs and Crockett show up. And they just grab him and strong harm 
strong arm him out of there and take him back to the precinct. And now we are ready to roll the opening credits. There was enough information in that opening sequence for an, for the entire episode, but instead blew it in about three and a half minutes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was almost going to say like, and that's the episode. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs> you know, I just realized something too, is that and by the time we get to the end of this, it dawns on me. None, none of them, none of the people they're arresting. And Jenna, this goes to your point you were making before we started the show. That this was a actual good police episode, like they're running leads and doing investigations and stuff. None of them, no one dies. They yeah, don't, they don't kill Lao Lee. They don't kill his grandkids. None of the no police officers get shot. Except for Minton. Minton is the only one that ends up getting shot and he doesn't die. Right. Like they're actually able mm-hmm. to apprehend or like safely transport whoever they need. Like the people under their custody don't die or kill other people. No, I mean, no. I, feel like this uh, is a I wouldn't say not everyone died. Just no actual speaking part characters. I mean, I'm sure Chinese guy number three didn't <laughs> like it biting the bullet. <laughs> true. That is true. There was lots of those guys got sacrificed throughout the episode, but they're kind of like, you know... The... Let's not <laughs> applaud them for being completely non-violent here. <laughs> but those guys fired first, so... Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever. Let's, 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 let's and I feel the... confident... Also, I feel confident in saying Chinese guy number three because at a certain point in this episode, they mix up Hong Kong and Thailand. That is true. The Minton says this is no longer Hong Kong. And yet none of these people who they're dealing with are, are from China or be near Hong Kong. Bangkok would be the place that they would, yes. that they would be from. Let's go to the precinct. This is where we finally kick off the episode and we're going to get some back information on what the hell is going on with Castillo. They brought Minton in and they're kind of interrogating him but it's not really interrogating so they're not in one of the rooms they're just they're just in an office. Tubbs and Crockett are there with Castillo and Minton. Of course right away Minton and Castillo recognize each other and there's I'm not 100% sure who Minton had worked with. They, he refers to him as either the agency or the company so I think it's like a sly way to say just some other government agency that Castillo didn't do work for. Castillo worked for the DEA. Minton worked for the CIA or someone else along those lines for the U.S. government. And they're working two different angles. So I think it's worth just pausing here for a second to talk a little bit more about our boy Minton, who's played by actor John Santucci. So I... I was intrigued by his Chicago accent and just happened to do a little bit more searching into his role on this. So he actually ends up coming back and in the true Miami Vice way, he will play several other characters (laughs) over the course of the series. (laughs) Of course he will. Of course. (laughs) We have that to look forward to. Um, And I also suspect that he was brought in because of his connections with Michael Mann, which I mean, that may not be the case, but that he played Holly Tagley on Crime Story, which predates Miami Vice, and Michael Mann was an executive producer on that as well. And it looked like they crossed over on like quite a few episodes. But nonetheless, we do end up seeing Santucci come back several times throughout the series. Wow. Of course, in Miami Vice, so, it's not the same person. Yeah, he's uh, Dale Menton, then he'll be Charlie Fusco, and he'll also be Harry Grubb. <laughs> so, <laughs> can't wait. I look forward to the Harry Grubbs episode. <laughs> So back to the episode. This is a very strange conversation. It basically starts with Castillo saying, uh, hey, remember that time in Bangkok? Everyone I was in charge of died and ends with Menton saying, I did it because of you. (laughs) (laughs) And and at no point is anyone under arrest. And Menton seems to be fairly confident that there that there are no consequences for him basically admitting that the CIA screwed up the DEA's operation there in Thailand. And at one point, basically compares Castillo to a cute little puppy. <laughs> well, so so here's the whole story. Castillo's working for the DEA. He's working the border between Thailand and and Burma. His job is, is he's trying to run down opium. There, And then the CIA is there. Menton is there. And he's with the CIA. They are working political angles in Bangkok. Lao Li is this middleman where both of them are working trying to bring down Lao Li. La- what Castillo finds out is that there's going to be a big run. They're moving tons of opium by rail. So Castillo does this investigation, finds out when it's going to happen, is going to do an ambush on the train to bring down all of this opium. But Menton finds out that this is what 
is going to happen. And he tips off Lao Li. There's going to be this ambush on his train. And then Castillo's crew gets wiped out in the process. Basically, his entire crew dies, including what would be like his tubs, right? When he was working for the DEA, his partner for three years dies. Yes. And then when Lao Li can't find Castillo's body, he grenades his house and presumably kills his Castillo's wife. Or at least that's what the impression that Castillo was under. Obviously, we know from last week's episode that his wife has survived and is now in the United States. And the reason why we, Minton and, turned over that, all of this is I, because they're worried about political problems in Bangkok. So he tipped off Lao Li. That's at least what, what he says now. This is also starting a trend of Castillo believing people are dead without actually checking into it because I found out this isn't the only time this story is going to come up where his tubs we might actually meet in a later episode. Oh! At least by the end of this, we pretty much have the entire backstory. And from what we know from last week is that we had too much show last week. And from here on out, we are stretched for information happening in this episode. This episode really slows down after this scene because we get this huge backstory on what happened in Thailand and his wife, Mei Ying, and thinking that she died in this huge bust. In reality, last week's episode should have ended when Zwitek offhandedly mentioned that it was a Thai on, on one of the guys on Zorba when, 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 when he got killed. And Castillo freaked out when he heard that it was something Thai related. We should have ended there. Then everything from there where we find out about Lao Li and then Castillo takes you away personal and his wife shows up. That should have been saved for this week because the rest of the episode is really thin. And the plot starts to really kind of go out of whack at, at, at this point forward, it stops kind of really making sense. And the same thing like you were talking about in the pre-show too, John. It's like, remember last week's episode, we began with Tubbs and Crockett bringing down a guy high on PCP yelling about cakes in a hallway. And now we're to Lao Li retiring in Miami and bringing his Castillo's wife to Miami as protection so that no one makes a move against him. Basically, and that's what leads to this next scene where basically Castillo confronts General Lau and General Lau basically tells him, yeah, I'm signing up for the AARP and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> He and that's what that's what the papers were last week, right? Why Lao Li was trying to get those papers? Because you see, after Castillo goes and meets with Lao Li in his in his limo, and Lao tells him, "Hey, I'm retired. I'm not breaking any more laws. I just want to be here in the United States." And then it goes to the very next scene. He goes to like where it's like a whole family meeting, and there's like 50 people, and it's got to be that. That's why he wanted those papers from last week from the Bolt because that was going to finalize being able to bring over everyone in his family, his grandkids and everything. Yes. The grandkids end up being the main bad guys in this episode so that's what he wanted right he just wanted to come and and live out the rest of his life in the, in the united states yeah i mean we see it's it's clearly a retirement party happy retirement grandpa <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> and that's, I, I like Lao Li. He seems like a nice kind of grandfather. <laughs> I found him to be very approachable. Well, and that's what it, there's just there's just a little foreshadowing because they hang. Like you just see the two guys, the, his grandkids. Which I just refer to them as the mullet duo throughout all of my notes. <laughs> yeah. They're the only ones. They just look totally impressed because Lao is telling them like, "Hey, no law breaking. We're by the books while we're here. Everyone, just take care of yourself. We have it. We we have what we what we want now." We live in America. We're, we're all here. Everything's good. And in that meeting, it's like it's whole families, right? Couples with children and everything. There's uh, He brought over his entire family. Yeah, which makes me wonder, is uh, Castillo's estranged wife part of his family? Maybe is that why he brought her over? I guess no, because her be. husband worked for his textiles company. And they, he, so Lau ended up, but I guess like Castillo breaks it down later, but he explains to them that like they've been able to trace it back and they see that Lau forced the hand to have this guy, like the new husband's job move to the u.s so that she would also be moved like they don't i mean she knows lao from him being like a former business dealer that castillo had was trying to take down but otherwise they don't know anything about him 
It just seems like this guy Lau is going through a, a lot of trouble just to move to Miami and retire. And I mean, there's he's not doing, he's not breaking any laws. They have nothing that they can prove from Thailand. So I mean, like, was any of Castillo's wife being brought over necessary? Well, and that's what we find out later is that the necessary part of it was is that Lau is nervous about Castillo. And that Castillo was going to try and make a run on him, try and get revenge for things that had happened in the past. And so he brought Mei Ying over as like, don't mess with me, because if you mess with me, I'm going to mess with Mei Ying. So that's what the whole thing was about, why he brought her. Right. Like, so, she's just something I, okay. for him to hold over over Castillo if Castillo were to get like two in his business. Okay, well, I guess that brings us to the next scene, which is, that is the ugliest front door I think I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I thought that the door um, handle was so cool. It's a dragon. It's no, so I mean, light racist. blue. I mean, that's the theme through this whole episode. Like, <laughs> if, if you were to stereotype anything Asian in this in the 80s right what what you would put together is essentially a case against this episode and how how racist americans are against asians it's border, this episode is borderline on they should have put giant buck teeth inside of their mouths too well yeah yes. but like it wouldn't be racist if i put that on my door right <laughs> seriously light blue with brass hinges giant brass hinges ah oh, it's terrible <laughs> Well, my door's more on theme because my door's red. Oh, it was not red. That seemed to be the the ugliness of the front door seemed to be the main takeaway from the scene. I mean, there was a little talk about her having a kid and a new husband, Look, but I, yeah, I the focus the seems thing, to be on okay? the front door. No, you like you clearly got hung up on the wrong thing because first of all, Eddie gives us what is probably the most creepy horrific smile that I've ever seen someone <laughs> give. Okay, okay. Let's so, let's let's set the scene. Let's set the scene. He goes and knocks on the door. It's Mei Ying's house. She opens up the door and they immediately fall together essentially. But we find <clears throat> out that she's remarried and he finds out because a kid comes running out from behind her. Now I want You see that split second, right? Where he's like, oh my God <laughs> <laughs> That yeah. kid looks like it might be mine. Oh well, shit actually let's talk about that a little bit because that kid sure looks a lot like a mini castillo not gonna lie when you meet her actual husband later it's like no wait <laughs> that kid doesn't look uh, like either uh, one of you <laughs> it's like that episode of friends so, where where rachel starts dating another guy who looks exactly like ross this is this is essentially yes. the exact same thing because mei ying ends up marrying a, another person who looks essentially exactly like castillo what yes the asian Castillo. <laughs> That's exactly what he is. Yes, but at this point, I think I want to talk more about how old exactly is Castillo's um, ex-wife. Because... I have my suspicions too, because we we know that five years ago was when he left Thailand, and that's when he thought she was dead. So that means they met well before then. That was the end of their marriage. So the beginning of their marriage is still kind of hazy. We are led to believe that it's at least three to four years because this is this was a he was stationed in Thailand for I want to say we they hinted at like four or five years so if she's 10 years let's just say 10 years ago they met what was she like 12 yeah because she 13? looks really young so nah I think she just aged really well could be could I be. don't and, know and I don't is, know this but is then the that, scene that's that supposed comes to be... back to how old do you th how old do you think the kid is? Because if their if their marriage ended five years ago, is the kid older than five? The kid is, and that's where that even though it looks like a mini Castillo, it can't be because he's clearly younger than five, or at least younger than six years old. That kid's like two or three, so it's definitely not a Castillo. Okay, so no more Povich <laughs> in Castillo's future. No, no. <laughs> so now that we find out that she's remarried, things get a little bit awkward. Yet yeah, the in the scene, like they, you can see they're still like they're so relieved to be able to see each other. But she definitely is remarried. So it's like their exchange is. Do you is, think he is uncomfortable? Do you think he regrets bringing Crockett and Tubbs as his wingmen? <laughs> That was weird. <laughs> okay, I was regretting that. Like, that was super awkward. 
as he was leaving the house. Yeah, he just he just brought him and left him. <laughs> At this point, Crockett and Tubbs, the only thing they've done in the show is basically drive Castillo around. And you know, there this this episode includes the entire Vice team, and you rarely see more than a few seconds of each. Yeah. So, but the, the entire Vice team, Trudy and Gina, are actually meeting with Noogie. Zwitek and Zito meet with Noogie. Crockett and Tubbs just drive around the lieutenant all day. Yeah, I mean, and that's what that's what's crazy <laughs> about this episode. That's what's crazy about this episode is how few times you actually see Crockett and Tubbs. So it's possible. Just keep that in mind because we talked about it before. It's like sometimes we don't need to always see Crockett and Tubbs. This is an, a case for that on how boring an episode can be if we reduce the amount of time Tubbs and Crockett spend on screen. <clears throat> We leave from Mei Ying's house and we go to, this is where we're finally going to get set up on what the whole point of this episode is going to be. We have Lao Li's mullet team, or his grandkids, show up to a restaurant and there they're going to meet who we learn later. His name is Howie Wong. And I continue to scratch my head on how this episode ever made it on TV and how racist they were against Asians in it. But what they're setting up is, is after their grandfather, Mr. Lao Li, who's a brutal drug dealer, after he said no more breaking laws, they got immediately in their Lamborghini, drove over to meet Howie Wong and said, hey, bro, you want to buy 50 kilos of heroin? As you do. (laughs) So after we see that there's this deal going down, immediately after General Lao, General Lao, remember, that's his name, his grandkids immediately go out and try and make a deal for selling a crap ton of heroin. We go back to the precinct and Castillo is meeting with the entire Vice team, which is always cool to see all of them together. Which, uh, just on a side note, do you think General Lao is a general as in like General Lee or general as in like Captain Crunch is like a captain? <laughs> I think it's just supposed to be like his, the amount of people that work for him, it was like an army. So he's, he's the general of that drug army. But now I'm always going to picture him wearing a blue sailor shirt and giant hat <laughs> with crunch berries in his pockets. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and like I was saying, this is, this is kind of cool when you see the whole vice team together. B team, the ladies, our crime duo, they're all there with Castillo. And Castillo is basically is saying what you were talking about earlier, Jenna, that he can't seem to justify spending all of the time of the Miami Vice team on tailing Lau. But by the end of it, they basically convinced him to do it. And he wants tails on everyone that's associated with Lau. So he sends out his team. He, t- he orders his team to like, go follow everyone and follow up on every lead that you see out there yeah so basically he he says my in-laws are in town so let's harass the shit out of them (laughs) and and they break out helicopters and speedboats and i mean they go all out over something that's at this point all they know is a personal vendetta uh between castillo and general lao yeah technically lao hasn't done anything wrong this is it's borderline police harassment right yeah and and the police have yet to get any i mean we've seen as the viewers the grandkids going and and looking for the drug dealer but the police haven't found any information to connect them to any kind of drugs or anything I mean, they're breaking out the helicopters before they even have a lead. After the mo- the short montage of them showing all the vice teams following everyone, we go to a brief scene where Menton is meeting with Lau. And you can see they're still close. And Menton looks like he's still kind of delivering some messaging from the quote unquote, the agency that he works for. And he's just telling Lau like, hey, your, pe- your family's out there spending money at high end shops that are known for laundering money. You might want to tell them to back off. And also like the tale By that the Castillo end. has. By- the way, it is is extensive. By the way, during that montage, I was singing "Take It to the Limit" the whole time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, danger Zone. <laughs> <laughs> and when this scene ends, where Menton is leaving, we have another awkward scene with the grandkids, right? And this is trying to show, like, the grandkids are out of control, not understanding the repercussions of their actions and what they're doing to, to the family. The grandkids are there. The two, the the mullet boys are there at their two hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini, putting in a novelty horn, and they show it to yes Men- to Menton, and he's like, "Hey, this is in Hong Kong, even though they're from Thailand. This is in Hong Kong." <laughs> Yes. You know what? This kind of stuff attracts attention. While you drive around in a freaking like two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini. Yeah, just ridiculous. A, a Lamborghini is not going to attract attention. Sure, 
Yeah, it's going to be the racist horn they are installing. <laughs> yeah. That's what's going to get people's attention. For the record, if I can ever afford an expensive car like that, a Lamborghini, uh, a Bentley, something along those lines, you know, something that says costs more than a house, I am totally putting in a horn, a novelty horn on that car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm And using the hell out of it. Every stoplight, every parking lot. Every, every time I pull up into a McDonald's drive through I'm using that novelty horn. I had never. Oh, hell I mean, yeah. I thought that if you got a novelty horn, it only really came with the, the cucaracha song. And that was like <laughs> your one option. I don't know where these guys are like special ordering other songs. <laughs> but they're doing it wrong. Well, after days worth of following around Lao's people, we go to a scene where Castillo is again. There, he's at dinner with the entire vice crew. And he's still lamenting like, I can't continue to have you all following and de- dedicating my whole department. You are not my private police force. Force. says that for 24 yes. more hours we're going to continue to look if nothing comes up then castillo himself will take a leave of absence and do the investigation on his own which we can attest to at this point that he is just bullshitting bullshit because he has no intention of taking a leave of absence he has no intention of miami vice not focusing their complete and utter attention on general Lau throughout the rest of this episode which lasts more than 24 hours so and at this point, now he is taking them out to dinner. And the one thing I can, uh, the two things I can gather is that one, he likes Thai food. And two, I bet you they're all getting tired of Thai food at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because since last, I mean, last episode, they went to every Thai restaurant in the whole city, right? Is that the only place that he eats? <laughs> is is this whole case because he just really likes Thai food and he happened to bump into some people he knew back in the day? No, John, now he can just finally be himself. Back <laughs> off, haters. Castilla's doing the right thing here, okay? <laughs> Gosh. Now the Vice team is getting desperate. They have 24 hours left that this, this fake cap that Castillo has put on, so they all hit the road. We go to a strip club. And who the most amazing scene of this, sorry, the second most amazing scene of this episode, who happens to be at the strip club? Noogie! Noogman! The Noogman. And he is having a fantastic time at the strip club. I think his entire dialogue in this scene just proves, one, Noogie is the greatest character ever made. (laughs) And two, Charlie Barnett was winging it the whole time he was filming these shows. Oh, absolutely. Um, Because none of this is written. In fact, two of my favorite, I mean, just some of my favorite stuff comes out of, of this conversation and the conversation that happens with him and Zito and Zwitek yes. at the drive-in. And that is my favorite scene of this episode is when they make it to the drive-in. So let's hurry up and get through the strip club scene because I love I love how he talks to Zito and Zwitek while we're there. And, and, and to wrap up on like Noogie having a good time, he looks like he's having a seizure with the lady that's dancing on stage. Like he is, he is so excited. He's just going to drop on the floor shaking because he can't handle it any longer. But <laughs> of course, to interrupt his fun that he's having as a strip club, the ladies of the Vice team show up, Gina and Trudy, and they grab Noogie and ask him if he knows anything about a score that's going to be happening on the street. And this is where the Noog man drops some really racist stuff, too, because they ask him if he knows anything that's going on. And he's like, they're Asian. And no- Noogie says, oh, like one so- some of them boat people. And I was like, oh. <sighs> Ooh. Oh, Vice Team, <laughs> yeah. Vice, Vice, what are you doing? And then they say, they, and then they say, like, well, can you help us? And he says, yeah, I can maybe get my shirts done. And then he does a really bad Asian accent. Yeah, and I'm like, oh. I'll, I'll start taking my clothes to to the laundromat and does the Asian accent with the yeah. Oh, uh, it was it was so bad. It was so. But I guess in I, his defense, in his defense. He's at a strip club, and they show up asking very loudly, do you know any Asian people? Not specifically (laughs) person. Do you know Johnny Chu or or Bobby (laughs) Wong? No, no, no. Do you know Asian people, and they might be selling heroin? This is a pretty generic thing to ask the nook man. And so he's like, he's like, yeah. He goes, okay, I'll start hanging out where Asian people are, and I'll ask around for you. I you mean, know? are you going to 
take but Zito in a and very Zytek... entertaining racist way. Yeah, like, are you even gonna take Zito and Zytek serious at this point? They're talking to him with like B. This is Gina and Judy, Jenna. Yeah, this uh, is still in haven't... the strip club. Oh. This is still talking about the strip club scene. Oh, I thought that he says that he's gonna go do the laundry when he's at the drive-in. No, no, he drops no. some other funny, hilarious stuff while he's there, especially yeah. with laying the hammer down on the B team too. But the, uh-huh. to, to, to finish up this scene, he says that if he hears anything, he's gonna tell him. But it might, it, it, in Noogie's defense, he's just overstimulated at this point, being there in the strip club, so he can't be held liable for anything he says, I guess. Yeah, and like I said. They're asking him a pretty generic question. Have you heard anything about Asian people recently? I mean, I, I don't expect him to be able to answer any uh, spe- with any specifics because I'm pretty sure he hasn't, up to this point, hasn't been looking for heroin dealers in Chinatown. No, he's only thinking about that ass. He's exactly. <laughs> he wants that nurse. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, let's go, let's go to all of our favorite scenes. So now the Nook Man's keeping an ear to, to the pavement, see what he can find out. The B team, I guess they're driving around undercover. They're driving around in an exterminator van. And I have quality sources it, that it, tell it, me do, that do you this call is them, a routine bit for them. I feel like now every time we call them the B team that there's a pun intended there. <laughs> no. I mean, now there is, right? <laughs> but don't worry, John, because they took care of ruining all possible puns related to insects because that's basically their entire dialogue with the girl who's like, are you just going to freaking order food or like, what do you want? <laughs> yeah. So they pull Even up the Stop. extras are annoyed by them. <laughs> yeah, because they, they pull up and there's like, it's, it's like a burger car hop type place where there's girls on roller skates out bringing food to your door, which they don't stay in their van. They pull up the van and then they see one and he, Zito says to Zwitek, wing her. He hits the horn. The horn causes the spider on top of the van to shake. It's like, boy, 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 boy. It's like, <laughs> it makes the worst sound ever. <laughs> So quickly, hold on. before we get to Noogie's part in this, I, I just want to say at this point, you, you guys have seen those Sonics commercials with the two really lame guys. Yes. Uh, yeah. Like that is instantly what I thought of with Zito and Zwitek here at this drive through. I'm thinking like, <laughs> oh, my God, they are as annoying as those Sonics commercials. Oh, it, they are exactly those guys. Yeah. So because they're not here. They just happen upon Noogie a- after talking to the waitress. They, they're they not there to find out information they just happen upon it so jenna like you're saying they get out of the van instead of waiting for the food to be brought to them which is what these places are supposed to be they get out and they put on these sun these like bug sunglasses that have wings on them and start harassing the staff that works at this restaurant i can't stand them like i j- i'm so i wish that they were never a part of this show yeah i cringe <laughs> every time we have to make it through a zito and spy tech scene so yeah they chop a bunch of bug related puns on the waitress who eventually gets fed up and leaves but you hear noogie in the background so the nook man comes over and yeah I, th- I think you're right john he's just shooting from the hip he comes over and he starts just laying the verbal smack down on zito and switek including my favorite like hey what's yes. up yogi and boo boo where's your picnic <laughs> basket yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no, no. Yo- yeah yogi and boo boo come to fill your picnic basket <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> and then oh my god and then one of my favorite lines too is don't be on the noogie <laughs> <laughs> that is just if, that is was, just fantastic there's only one redeeming quality in this episode and it is the scenes in which noogie is in them which of course he's a tour de force right we backed ourselves into a corner as writers so how do we get out of this i don't know what's noogie up to dude and it's you noogie's always the one that solves the case for him i mean if you look at this Gina and I mean, Trudy go ask Noogie for help. Noogie no- tells Noogie Zito and, and Zytek about the deal that leads to them catching the grandkids that ultimately seals the deal at the end of the episode. Like, Noog Man comes through. And, and then on top of all of that, Charlie Barnett is, just, like I said, he is just freestyling and just hilarious. And by the end of this scene, what they he says that he has information. He won't give it up unless they feed him. Like, no, give us the information first. Who is it? What's this word on the street? He says that there's a, a root. The word on the street is, is that there's a whole bunch of new heroin that's, that, that's about to come in. And then to make Noogie speak, Zwitek just picks him up like a child. And Noogie yells out, Howie Wong! And that's the end of that. And I, I feel so bad for Noogie because the vice 
team is always so mean to him, unnecessarily mean to him, right? Because he's he can be killed for giving up this information that they constantly ask him for. They're constantly asking for him to go and ask around about dangerous people and then rat them out to them. I mean, in fairness, it's more dangerous to be a like to have them try and protect you than to distance yourself True. from the vice team after giving them important True. information. <laughs> so that might be and, why Noogie's still alive, honestly. That, and the way that Noogie is so just nonchalant about doing it for him makes me think that maybe Noogie's a badass. We just True. don't know. True. Maybe Noogie is like Omar. Omar from The Wire. Yeah, I mean, I just I just get the feeling like there's a whole other side of, of Noogie we're missing out on. Of course, after the B team leaves from sexually harassing the staff at this burger place and treating Nookie like a child, they go to the Macau restaurant, which is where Howie Wong is. Howie's there meeting with, with the grandkids again. They're doing their little test before they make the big deal. They bring up the test. Howie's impressed with what the stuff is. The B team goes inside and picks up Howie. The only th- now they're just going off of what Nookie has told them so I don't think they he's actually under arrest they're just taking him in for questioning and there, there's another moment in this scene where there's like oh my god Miami Vice why are we are we going Asian on this racist jokes don't yeah yes. because oh, they- yeah and throw in some wontons yeah, and then the B team sees the Lamborghini parked up front, like, oh, well, well, it looks like Nogi was right. And then Zito says, we should get him a solid gold egg roll. Oh, Vice, why are we doing this? I know, I know. Well, they pick up so, Howie but, and they I bring mean, him back to the precinct. And so, at least at this point, we finally, the episode finally heads down a direction in which an arrest could be made. Finally, start to close in on General Lau's grandsons getting uh, and the vice team getting close to an arrest. And I guess they would be Sergeant Lau's, Tenant Lau's. <laughs> Wait, True. what? The James Private Sato? Lau's. <laughs> Sorry, back back up for a second, because James. Sato, the guy that plays Howie Wong, guess what other movie he was in? He played Shredder in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies. Oh, really? No <laughs> way. <laughs> nice. Wow. <laughs> well, with Howie, they get him back to the precinct. They basically interrogate him. He he agrees to wear a wire. So we go to, and they don't show any of that. We just know that that's what it is. We go to the bus. We're back at the restaurant. Howie's meeting with the grandkids and several other bodyguards in the back of the restaurant. They're able to catch on the I'm oh, sorry this is this isn't a wire that's later in the episode they just know that the deal's going to go down the vice team and the Miami police department are ready in the middle of the deal they come busting in there's a slight shootout well, my favorite thing of the shootout is that there's one guy standing in the middle of it he puts his arms up and he's like hey I ain't even with these fools I don't know why I'm here just ignore me when the as the police drop all kinds of people around him the grandkids uh-huh. go running for the front door and a, and Crockett Tubbs and Crockett are waiting out front for him and they're able to put him under arrest this scene happens pretty fast I the only thing of importance from this scene is that you see at the end of it that Castillo is really introspective and he looks nervous because they're making this bust. Which is funny because the the following scenes, so he looks nervous about making the bust and we kind of get a little dance around and then basically Castillo goes very quickly to General Lau and rubs in the fact that they just arrested his grandson. Yeah, and that's a really short scene. That's all he does. But he needs Lau. He, he needs Lau to be pissed off and have to go pick up Tweedledee and Tweedle Dumbass from jail so that he can ultimately, because he knows that Lau's going to flip out, right? Like, it's all an elaborate ruse. True, and so we have a ruse to get his recipe for General Lau's chicken. (laughs) Well, we have we have those two brief scenes. Cassio goes to Lau and tells him, like, hey, we picked up your grandkids. They're under arrest for selling 50 kilos. That's it. That's all that scene is for. We go to Mei Ying's house. This is where we see Mei's new husband, who suspiciously looks a lot like Castillo. So and Asian tells, Castillo. Yep. And he tells them, the only reason why you're here is to, is to Lau can guarantee his own safety because of how much I care about your wife. Like, awkward. Yeah, well, well, well let, let, let's, right? not just, yeah, let's not run through this. Castile looks her new husband in the eye and basically says, you guys are in trouble because I want to bang your wife. (laughs) And then just moves on with the conversation. (laughs) No big deal. Then we have another short scene where we go back to Menton's house. And this is, we have had a long gap of time now where we haven't seen Tubbs or Crockett. We finally see them in a a typical Vice scene where we go to his house and and Tubbs and Crockett have like, 
have they broken in to his house? It looks like they just broke in. And I, I think so. And, and they can hear on the, the other side of the wall, there's like a, some giggling going on behind it. And they hit a button and the wall opens up. And Menton's having like a wife swap in that secret room. Yeah, it's there's, like... there's two women and a guy. So it's like there's definitely some like a mini orgy wife swap thing going on in there. The, and yeah, I think and so... That... The the young the young man in Menton's bed is wearing the same like swimming briefs that Castillo was wearing in the opener. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe he only had one. It pair. must have been popular. <laughs> it, it was in circle. that year. <laughs> So my biggest takeaway in this scene isn't the fact that they're threatening Minton. It's more that we are finding out how Crockett gets all of his Ferraris. It basically, Crockett tells him because of the omnipresent act of 19... 19- and 32 um <laughs> 1984 <laughs> yeah he's sure basically uh, Minton that has basically still gotten gains yeah and that they're gonna take everything of theirs and everything of the laos basically Cro- crockett's gonna be driving around in a white lamborghini pretty quick here <laughs> true true yeah because they, they just threaten Minton with like hey we know your buddies with lao and all this stuff that you have this fancy house the cars it's all because of your your you have ill-gotten gains by being a partner with lao Yi. so now here we are we're gonna go to uh we go back we have a brief stop over at the precinct where he tells the team to to put to lift the no bail on the grandkids and let them out because now we're going to come to the scene where they're gonna finally gonna bust down Lee. Guards are so they they just release the kids from jail and they're back out on the street. Of course they go back to Lao Lee's house and we now we're gonna begin this last scene. We see the kids are being taken out of the house forced by guards and shoved into a car. Castillo is riding in the back seat with the B team, and they're going to tail this car out to one of Lowey's textile facilities there in Miami. I think it's one of his buildings. I think that's that's what they were hinting to them because that's where Ying's, where Castillo's ex wife, where her husband works. Yeah, it's one of Lee's. Yeah. I think buildings. that was the that 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 way it makes complete sense why they would transfer him to America. So they they end up going to this warehouse. And Lau goes into a brief talk about how he's disappointed with how the kids were acting and that he's ruined their family. The kids talk one of the kids. And and ultimately they're grounded forever. (laughs) Yeah, in a dirt nap. One of the kids is wearing a wire. (laughs) Isn't that how they get audio? I'm not 100 percent sure how they get audio of Lee saying that 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 they're gonna kill him. I'm not sure how they get audio either, but I'm I'm pretty sure that this is Castillo's big plan is to get Lau, who hasn't broken the law up to this point, to murder his own grandkids. Yeah, uh, that is and the that, whole and that's plan. what they ultimately arrest him. That's the whole plan. Good one, you know, clever goose Castillo. Uh, yeah, I don't think they have any involvement with the actual kids. They just release the kids and follow them to the meet. That's And that's the whole plan. It's like, we're, we're going to release them. Lau is going to be disappointed with what they did and how they're ruining what's, what the family's able to do in America. And then and Lau does say out loud, it's like, kill them and get, get rid of them and kill them. When they say that, the Miami police and the vice team bust in. There's a brief shootout. And the only good thing that happens in the shootout is that Crockett shoots Minton, who happens to be there, too. And the look on Crockett's face, like, oh, shit, I can't believe I just shot him. At the end of the shootout, they they eventually have everyone cornered and they place Lowley under arrest for attempted murder. This is a really strange scene, too. Before General Lau loaded into the cruiser, while smiling, him and Castillo have a really kind of lighthearted conversation for a second about how it's funny how things work out in the end and almost kind of makes it seem like now General Lau and Castillo are, are like best friends for life now. You know what I thought it was like was that Castillo was on his own show. Like we've totally lost track of Miami Vice and it was like a pilot for a Castillo only show where the main bat, where the recurring bat bad guy that Castillo always has to try and run down is General Lao Lee. Yeah, I, I can see that, where it's almost like, like, oh, you caught me this week, Castillo. Yeah, I'll be back out on the street in 24 hours, and then every third episode is about him trying to catch something that Lao Lee's up to. I think it's remarkable but yeah. that Lao Lee is, like, for sure a dude that has not been the greatest in his life. Like, he's probably done a lot of shifty stuff. And yet, in this scene, you feel like he takes the higher road and Castillo is just kind of like an asshole. Right? Because he's like, even, you know, you get to a point where, like, you can respect your adversary. And Castillo is just like, mm, 
no, no. Like, just, just walks <laughs> away. So it's like, yeah. okay. Well, okay. And, and on top of all of that, I mean, for a guy who just tried to murder his grandkids and who is, whose retirement's been, been gone, thrown down the drain and it's now going to spend the rest of his life in prison, he's extremely upbeat. I'm rather okay with everything that's going on. Well, I mean, let's face it. Odds are that that guy, like some a judge or someone, comes to pick him up, and then he takes off in one of those air, like on water airplanes, <laughs> like we have in the beginning. He, he, he really no has. Way that he uh, uh, oh, you trial. got me, kind of attitude. At this well, point, people um, are flocking to Miami because they know how inept the police force is there. <laughs> well, we we go from this. And we jump from this to Castillo having his ex-wife deported. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's definitely that, going into like some sort of protective custody, like he's having her leave. And I think this is the closest that we get to seeing real emotion out of Castillo, right? So that he just he seems he looks kind of like he's happy that he was at least able to take care of her. They're seeing each other for probably what is the last time that she's going to leave forever. Is, that, they never actually say where they're going, right? And I said I don't know if they're sending them back to Thailand or if they're just moving them out of Miami. Are they sending them back to Hong Kong? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a very what? What's the mo- Casablanca feel mm-hmm. to it? You know. See, yeah. I felt like that at first, but then it kind of took more of a Beverly Beverly Hills Cop type ending with him getting in the convertible with Crockett and Tubbs, and then them d- just kind of cruising around. Oh yeah, that was ridiculous. Have I ever uh, once um, in the time that you've known like, me said I want to get a drink? Do you remember the music the from Beverly Hills Cop? No. Okay, they had that kind of 80s kind of saxophone play-in music when they jumped from scene to scene in the movie Beverly Hills Cop. Like, that's what I expected like at the end of the episode. He hops into the convertible and I expected that 80s kind of saxophone solo to kind of play and then the the quip about going out for a drink. And I think that's the only thing that we get out of this episode is that by the end of this, the Vice team has a much different opinion about Castillo and that they, they see them as one of as one of them. Like it's a it's a closer group now. And we're well, I mean, we're just gonna move on like if nothing that, happened. And, and if that's the point, I definitely have a much different view of Castillo. But that I mean, that happened in the first few seconds of having to see him in a speedo. <laughs> All right. Well, that's gonna <laughs> sum up this episode. I mean, we we went down a long, weird journey from someone screaming about cake to Zarbo getting bitch slapped. Oh, not Zarbo, <laughs> but the other police officer getting bitch slapped in front of the hotel by Tubbs to now Castillo and General Lau having the mutual understanding that they will forever be enemies. Let's move on and uh, talk about the music in this episode. All right, John, I missed most of the music in this episode. I guess I just didn't hear it in the background. What do you got for us this week in music? Okay, so this week in music, we have the songs Catch the Wind by the Blue by the Blues Project, which is a cover of a song by the art of it, the artist Donovan. And with the song, not a whole lot that really caught my attention except the just the sheer number of times that song was covered in particularly between 1965 when it was released to 1970 it was covered 14 times damn whoa yeah so people really liked that song in the 60s and it was covered by artists like Cher, Glenn Campbell, Buck Owens and even Sammy Hagar later but the there were two people in particular that kind of caught my attention as kind of strange who covered the song. Please One be Alvin and the Chipmunks. At- please be Alvin and the Chipmunks. Please oh, be Alvin please, and the please, Chipmunks. Please, no. Please, please. <laughs> no, I was hoping for that too. But no, it was actor Peter Fonda covered it on an album. <laughs> yes, as strange as that is, and it gets stranger, it gets even more abstract because he covered it on an album that was his interpretation on a Graham Parsons album. Oh, so, okay. And then the other person that caught my attention was, did you know Katie Seagal, Katie Seagal from Married with Children who plays Peggy from Married with Children released she's also three on, albums? She's also on Sons of Anarchy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Did you and know is she released- Mila's voice on Futurama. Yeah, did you know that she released three pop albums? No. No. What? <laughs> yes. it, 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 in the 
2002 to 2006 era, yeah, she released three pop albums, the second of which containing a cover of this song. So wait a minute, wait a minute. From 2000 to 2006, so while she was actively a voice on Futurama and in that, um, what was that show um, with the guy from Three's Company? Um, oh, the 10 rules oh, yeah. my teenage daughter. Yeah. So yeah. while she was doing those shows, she was also releasing pop music albums? Yes. What? Wow. Yes. And this one, uh, the song Catch the Wind, uh, was covered on her 2004 album, The Room. So that was, wow. that was what was interesting about that song. So the second song in the episode, entitled Poison Ivy, released by the Coasters. The album came out on the, the album... Uh, I mean, the song came out on the album In a Fog for You, released in 1959. It was number one on the R&B charts and number seven, top 100. And, well, pretty much what really caught my attention for this song was that this song is a metaphor for catching an STD. What? Yes, I, you, you heard that correctly. So, pretty much one of the co-writers of the song Jerry Lieber uh, was quoted com uh, talking about how the song was basically about getting an STD from a girl, comparing a girl to measles, mumps, chicken pox, common cold, whooping cough, but is deemed worse because, quote, poison ivy, Lord, will make you itch. <laughs> on a funny side note that song was this song poison ivy was covered twice by the rolling stones and once by the kingmans and oh yeah covered by hansen <laughs> i was still hoping so you were case, gonna say alvin of the chip <laughs> no 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 in case in, in case you were hoping the end sentence was gonna make any sense whatsoever i threw in hansen just to throw you completely off <laughs> so and that leads just to the final song in the episode, the song Mr. Lee by the the Bobettes. This is this is actually the most intriguing part of the music, being that the Bobettes were one of the very first all-girl R&B groups in the 50s, but they were also one of the first all-African-American female groups from the late 1950s. The Bobettes came out right before the Chantels and several other groups released the song Mr. Lee as their first top 10 hit, and actually as the, the first top 10 hit by an all-girl group ever in 1957. The, so th they're actually a pretty big deal, which is kind of surprising due to the lack of information I was actually able to find that to find on them. There's very little actual biography written about them, but they are... A, uh, they are from Spanish Harlem, New York. They were first known as the Harlem Queens as a group in 1955. And they, their first big hit was Mr. Lee. So a Atlantic record executive uh, heard the song and liked it, but originally didn't like the song was originally about how the how much the girls hated their fifth grade school teacher actually named mr lee and the atlantic record exec liked the song but didn't like the negative point of the song and so had them rework the lyrics to be about a girl who actually has a crush on her grade school teacher mm. That's awkward. So the song would actually kind of hang over their heads for the rest of their career to the point in which they actually wrote in the uh, early 70s a song called I Shot Mr. Lee uh, as kind of a way to try and get out from under the shadow of that because they would never chart as high as they did with the song Mr. Lee. Ultimately, 1974, they would unofficially disband but would continue to tour it on the oldies circuit, which apparently I read this on multiple different sources. They all referred to it as they toured on the oldie circuit. So apparently there's some sort of like retirement home. Um, <laughs> Denny's at five at five o'clock um, touring of old musicians, I guess. So but the last little bit of information I will leave you. With, about them is that one of their members in 1980 member Danny Pote was randomly stabbed to death by a stranger while walking down the street minding her own business in Jersey City, New Jersey. Wow. That took a dark and turn. It took a very dark turn. 
And no matter how much digging I did, there was no more information able to be released except the fact that she was minding her own business and it was an unstable man who randomly stabbed her to death. Wow. That is it. That escalated yes, they quickly. Do not, there, there is just there is no more information. I only that was I I that they only had a little snippet of information about that in any of the articles I read. Like I said, they're kind of a big deal, but they're not. Like they should be a big deal, being that they the first female R&B group to ever chart, the first all African American female group R&B group to ever chart you know one of their members was brutally murdered like I feel like there's a made for TV movie in there somewhere yeah well I guess credit so, to the Vice team this week because it feels like we've really fallen off on music but credit to the Vice team this week for digging up some tracks some some deep cut tracks yeah yeah it wasn't that typical whatever was popular the, the, at the time when they released the episode this was all pre-thought out out early you know talking late 50s early 60s songs mm -hmm. so kudos to them uh and it definitely made for a lot more interesting uh research um well, let's uh... and a nice jingle about tds <laughs> i don't know i'm never gonna recover about the song being written during a pillow therapy punching session <laughs> so i don't think anything is ever gonna gonna live up to that so let's move on and close out this episode and give our final thoughts all right, Jenna, let's start off with you this week. What are your final thoughts on this episode? All right, so I think we more or less alluded to it, and I share your, I share your thoughts um, on that this, this episode was, you know, a little lackluster. I mean, I know I spent the majority of it sort of defending, um, but really just to try and play devil's advocate. Um, I, I would imagine my experience to be something like you blow up a balloon with the intent of making a balloon animal, and then someone just lets the air out slowly in front of your face and walks away. Like, that's sort of how <laughs> or, my experience Or, felt. as we heard earlier, this week about wanting to have someone make you a balloon animal and then the animal turns out to be a, <laughs> then the animal turns out to be a penis <laughs> Uh, so aside from that, I feel like we did a, a good job diving in and out of like all the things that make the episode whatever, right? Like it it could have been better, but for the most part, I'm just happy that they actually were successful police officers to some degree, right? Like the quote unquote bad guys were apprehended. You assume that they're going to be tried or whatever, and the people who they were trying to look after lived. So I mean that's all good, right? Um, but. Beyond that, I would say that that it's the like side characters that I'm interested in. I mean, at this point, I'm just making. Uh, I I assume that we're going to see most of our side characters come back. Maybe not as themselves, um, but that we'll see them multiple times. And I just so I've been reading more on Santucci, uh, who plays Dale Menton in this episode. And uh, highlight for him is that he was a real life jewel thief. Before mm. Michael Mann hired him as a technical advisor on Again? his 1981 movie, Thief. And Again, that's with like the Vice start of getting their... people that have a background in whatever they cast them in. Right. So, and coincidentally, Michael Mann purely must just be looking for local criminals because Dennis <laughs> Yo, Farida. Well, either that or he just hangs out with ex cons. <laughs> yeah, Dennis Farida was the star of Crime Story, which Santucci also played on after making Thief with Michael Mann. And it's a Michael Mann executive produced show. Um, anyway, it's just, it all feels very Illuminati the way that these things are tied. Uh, well, the only other thing that I'll point out is that we do get Mei, Mei Ying and Ma Sek back, apparently. Um, but they are not played by the people who play them in this episode. However, James Sato, who plays Howie in this episode, yeah, does no, I'm sure Mei Ying will be played by someone younger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I didn't see a striking resemblance between Masek and Howie Wong in this episode, but apparently they're interchangeable enough that uh, hmm. that Howie comes back to play Masek in in Heart of the Night. Interesting. Well, I mean, I, I'm going to keep my my rundown short. You know, I don't really have anything much to add to that. You know, I will say I, I had high hopes for this episode. We have every Vice member, B-Team, 
duo, the ladies, we have Noogie, we have everything that should have made this into a great episode. And based on how the first half went, I had I'm, I probably just had too high a hopes. They do a good job of summing up the story. We get a background on who Castillo is and, and building rapport with the team. But I'll take a few seasons in between Castillo stories. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? So my my final thoughts are kind of just expanding kind of a little bit on your guys' stuff. But I mean, I think it is... It is clear that Golden Triangle Part 1 and Golden Triangle Part 2 were directed by two different people. Because Golden Triangle Part 1 had a little bit of everything, and it it was too much. Like, they couldn't decide on what plot they wanted to go with. And then you have Golden Triangle Part 2, where there's there's literally next to nothing. They're just beating the Castillo storyline to death and not capitalizing on anything... That they really should be capitalizing. I mean, we ended part one with Ninja Castillo, and we're stuck with emotional Castillo through the entire part two. I don't want emotional Castillo. I don't want possible pedophile Castillo. I want Ninja Castillo. <laughs> Get you a man that can do both. <laughs> In a I'm just saying. I wanted to see Castillo dressed in black and dropping down from ceilings and showing off some of that DEA special training that he supposedly has. Um, instead, we got Castillo in a speedo, and we got his a uh, bunch of stuff about his feelings and a very strange storyline that really could have been a heck of a lot more exciting. I mean, they could have at least blown something up, or there could have been a car chase. I mean, they just. I don't know. So that that's my take on it. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We, um, Although we're kind of let down with the second half of this story, it's still classic Vice. And anything is always good whenever the Noog Man makes an appearance, especially when he refers to Zito and Switek as Yogi and Boo Boo. <laughs> We thank you for checking out this episode. We encourage you to subscribe or uh, just spread the word about the show and let other people know about the show. You can find out all of the information about how to subscribe, follow us on social media, or how to follow the show on our website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can email the show at GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. And uh, we thank you again for listening, and we'll see you all next week. Bye, pals. And remember, folks, don't boogie on the noogie. (laughs) 